Greetings all, Chieftain here. It is the Christmas season, a time of cheer, peace, goodwill to all men, and so on. A perfect time for me to tell you about the most traumatic experiences of any US tankers in the history of the US tank force. I refer not to the bitter fighting in Hurtgen Forest or the stalemate in Italy, or the reversals in the Ardennes or North Africa, bad though they may have been. This is the story of a group of reservists, National Guard tankers from California, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, and Kentucky who left their friends and families along with their states at a time that their nation was not yet at war or involved in the conflicts going on overseas. These were the men of the 194th and 192nd Tank Battalions. They were called to active duty in February of 1941. Most of the survivors did not return home until the second half of 1945. Still issued with a lot of World War I equipment, such as the wide-brimmed helmet, they did not fight in commonly visited tourist spots, nor with or against cool, eye-catching equipment, such as panzers. Together with about 140,000 other men, of which some 31,000 were American, they fought in the Philippines, and as such were the first US tankers to see action in World War II. As tensions between Japan and the US began to ramp up, the British and American governments began to realize that the Japanese were unlikely to easily accept the Western powers' positions. But it was also a potential third wartime front which nobody, especially in the UK, wanted to have to fight. In a critical misreading of the situation, it was decided to prolong negotiations in order to allow time for the reinforcement of the Western garrisons in the Southwest Pacific. Once the US and British military strength was sufficiently large to perform as a deterrent to military action by Japan, Japan will be left with no option but to accept the negotiated settlement. Further details on this series of errors can be found on my Countdown to Pearl Harbor article over on the World Warship site. Two of the National Guard's four tank battalions will be dispatched to the Philippines as part of this deterrent force, minus B Company of the 194th, which got diverted to Alaska. The 194th, under Lt. Col. Ernest B. Miller, left San Francisco on the 8th of September 1941, having just accepted delivery of M3 light tanks to replace their previous M2s. The 194th had been rated as the best tank battalion in the Army after evaluations earlier in the year, but though the automotive and running components were very similar, the gun was not. The tankers would have to learn the care, feeding, and use of the 37mm guns on their new mounts after they got to the other end, three weeks later. Such as it was, they were not issued any high explosive rounds for whatever reason. Further, the terrain that they would be fighting over and also training, of course, would bear very little resemblance to the California coast or Minnesota with which the crews were familiar. When they arrived in Luzon, the two tank battalions were organized as the Provisional Tank Group under the command of Colonel R. N. Weaver. For some reason, the group was retained under the direct command of U.S. Army Forces Far East, which is basically Douglas MacArthur, and not under the control of Major General Wainwright, who was the ground forces commander. Training was limited given that no fuel or ammunition were released for training purposes. Pearl Harbor may be remembered as being on December the 7th, but in the Philippines it was the early morning of December the 8th when the notification came through. Between them, the two tank battalions had 108 tanks and 46 half-tracks around Clark Field near Manila, where some 35 B-17s and a good number of P-40s were all closely lined up to protect against saboteurs. There was a little bit of a side controversy to the story. A number of the aircraft had been scrambled earlier in the day under the orders of Hap Arnold to ensure that in the event of another dawn attack they would not be on the ground. Then they were to rearm to attack Formosa, from where any Japanese attacks would be expected to come. After incoming aircraft were detected by radar, orders to scramble the pursuit squadrons again came down, but confusion reigned, combined with terrible timing. Some fighters were sent to cover Manila instead of Clark, 
Fighters from the 3rd Pursuit Squadron at the other field at uh, Ilba were bounced, returning to the base low on fuel, and the 20th Pursuit Squadron was mainly destroyed as it was trying to get off the ground. Regardless of the unknownst to the tankers goings on in the skies, a little after lunch the tankers got their first taste of combat as Japanese aircraft attacked the base. Their first kill came from a Tech Sergeant Zenon Bardowski of the 192nd, who downed an attacking aircraft with a machine gun on his half-track. A second kill was given to Private Earl G. Smith of Charlie of the 194th. The first loss came in in the same raid, Private Brooks of the 194th. And that is the source of the name for the main parade field in Fort Knox, by the way. Later that day, the Japanese invasion of the Philippines began with a landing on the island of Batan, uh, about 120 miles north off the coast of the main island of Luzon. The man commanding the 14th Army, which is basically the Philippines invasion force, Lieutenant General Homa Masaharu, was well familiar with the Western world, having been found with the British Army in France in 1918, and later being assigned as Japanese attaches both in India and the UK. His main landing on Luzon, or what was seen to be at least, came on the 10th, when a number of beachheads were established in the far north of the island. Limited response came from the American defenders that it was just simply too far from the defenders' center of gravity, which was seen to be Manila, and the nearby peninsula of Bataan, which was a last redoubt. There was little seen to be gained by moving out to meet these forces, especially given the nature of the terrain, the distance, and the likely difficulties to be met in conducting such an operation. Things became a tad more complicated, however, on the 12th, when a couple of thousand Japanese also landed at the south end of Luzon. The next day, the tankers were split, with the 194th being directed to join the South Luzon force. The tanks were placed under the temporary command of Brigadier General Albert M. Jones, but outside of patrolling for 5th columnists, they actually had fairly little to do. Again, the distance to the landing site was too great for any practical reaction. Things really began to change on the 22nd of December. Up until then, the landings had been a few thousand men here, a few thousand men there. The southern landing at Legazpi was about 2,500 men strong. But that morning at Lingayan Gulf, however, that saw the landing of well over 40,000 men on the Philippines, and they were a lot closer to Manila. This demanded a response, and the 192nd was sent north, until it ran out of fuel. With reports coming in of a Japanese motorized column coming into the town of Demortis, the unit pulled together its fuel resources and sent forth a single platoon of B Company 192nd Tank Battalion under the leadership of Ben Morin, a lieutenant. At about 11 a.m., as the platoon was continuing north to the battle which was taking place between the Japanese and the Philippine 26th Cavalry, they came under direct air attack. Fortunately, the bombs merely scratched the paint of the tanks. They soon arrived afterwards at the fight about two miles south of Agu to encounter the sights of wounded horses of a cavalry unit under air attack. Given their proximity to the battlefield, Marin ordered a test fire of his guns. The 37mm immediately locked in the full recoil position and became unserviceable. However, Japanese infantry soon became a more pressing priority, and Marin's tank engaged with machine guns only. In effect, so did the other tanks anyway, given the lack of HE ammunition, and I can't find any reference to canister at the time. Not that the machine guns were trouble-free, the coaxial for Marin turned into a single-shot bolt action. All was going well, until the first shell slammed into his M3, dislodging the driver's hatches. Marin pulled his tank back out in order to fix the door, only to have his tank rammed by a Japanese one. This damaged the running gear, so that the tank swung out of control when the gas was applied. More shells impacted Marin's tank, eventually it had to be abandoned. Marin and his three crewmen became the first US tankers not only to engage in armored combat in World War II, but also to be captured. The other four tanks in the platoon were also all hit, resulting in the death of Private Henry Deckert, a bow gunner, and thus the first US tanker to be killed in tank combat. Three of these four tanks were able to withdraw under their own power, the fourth had to be towed. 
However, between air attack and mechanical failure, all four tanks were lost later that day. The US Army's first tank action in World War II was basically a loss. What is interesting is that all the US accounts seem to refer to turretless tanks with a 47mm gun, which resisted 37mm fire. The problem is that nothing fitting that description was really in the Japanese inventory at the time. The 192nd then performed a fighting withdrawal back south. In the meantime, the 194th was recalled from its patrolling duties as chasing saboteurs and sent north. There was an additional happy circumstance. A British merchantman which had been sailing for Singapore instead pulled into Manila, producing from its holds some 40 universal carriers. They did not come with Bren guns, but it turned out that one could mount an M19 1930 cal or even a 50 cal. About half were retained with the tank group, and the rest were given to the Filipinos. With the tankers, they performed fairly good service in the roles of supply transport and route reconnaissance. The carriers could go check out the ground for far less headache than the tanks would have should they get stuck. Now both battalions are involved in the retrograde, but things don't go well. On the evening of the 25th of December, Charlie 194th found itself cut off when the neighboring infantry unit pulled back without telling them. A Japanese anti-tank ambush lay between them and the bridge across the Agno River, which was their way out of the enemy's clutches. Two M3s were lost. The rest did a balls-out charge, firing every weapon as they drove, made it through the ambush and across the bridge, which was then blown after the last tank drove across it. They did better than Delta of the 192nd, or Dog back then, which was attached to the 194th. When they got to their crossing point at Moncada, they discovered that the bridge had already been blown. They had no choice but to disable their 10 tanks and two half tracks and cross the river on foot. Merry Christmas. A couple of the Stuarts would show up again later on in the campaign with Japanese crews. By the 26th, it was obvious that the island as a whole was lost. So MacArthur went with the expected Plan Orange, which was basically the hole up in Bataan and Corregidor, the peninsula west of Manila, which controlled Manila Bay. The original intent was that the American forces would hold out there for some six months until relief could come from the US. Of course, the US, especially after Pearl Harbor, combined with the focus on Europe, could not do that. Worse, the frictions of war hit, and a lot of the supplies which were to be used for the coming siege never made it to Bataan. Later that day, C of the 194th was ordered to do a bit of a recon down a trail under guidance from a Filipino infantry major that the enemy only had infantry weapons. Well, it turned out they had an anti-tank gun. The first tank to come around the corner, Lieutenant Needham's, was promptly knocked out. The second tank in line under Staff Sergeant Emil S. Morello pulled around the first, and notwithstanding a non-penetrating hit which knocked a rivet out, and that rivet then wounded one of the crewmen, performed actions to destroy an enemy anti-tank gun exactly as had been prescribed in doctrine, and was the ruling, by the way, in the Louisiana maneuvers, the only way to destroy an anti-tank gun. He ran over it. Dramatic though it was, and memorialized in painting and monument, the engagement was a loss. The gun was not the only heavy weapon present, and the whole platoon's tanks were eventually knocked out. Not all engagements came out badly, however. The end of the year saw a few high points for the tankers. A of the 192nd wiped out a bicycle battalion which rode through the bivouac on the 30th, and the 31st saw the clash at Baliwag. Baluag was about six miles from the road leading from Manila to Bataan. If that road were cut, any remnants of the South Luzon force would have been stuck in Manila facing either a city fight, surrender, or perhaps the faint hope of a submarine PT boat or some other nautical miracle. The withdrawing 91st Filipino and 51st US infantry divisions still had to complete their move up to the bridge at Columpit. Initially holding the town was the 71st Infantry Division of the Philippine Army, which repelled the first Japanese assault by a battalion of the 48th Infantry, supported by the 4th and 7th Tank Regiments. Commanding the Japanese attack was a Colonel Seinsuke Sonoda, advised by a Colonel Yorki Mittal of the Panzer Corps. 
Actually, he did a little bit more than advise, acquitting himself quite well in the eyes of his Japanese colleagues by his demonstrations in the field of the proper use of techniques for small arms and satchel charges against live defending targets. However, the 71st had to walk back the nine miles to the bridge as well, so they couldn't hang out at Balawag indefinitely. As a result, the task was given to see the 192nd from Port Clinton, Ohio. Their motors would help them to make the run. To help them out were a half dozen M3 tank destroyers and an artillery observer. Instead of hanging around waiting, they took the fight to the enemy and entered Balawag at about five in the afternoon. The M3 gun motor carriages were positioned in an overwatching position nearby. As at the time, tank radios tended not to be able to talk with anyone else's, the M3s and artillery observer were loaned a scout car from the tank unit, which had a compatible radio. Also entering Balawag at about this time were at least two platoons, if not a full battalion, from the 7th Tank Regiment, Type 97 Chiha. These were not the upgraded type with the 47mm anti-tank guns, they still had the older, more common 57s. This did not go well for the Japanese, as the 57s had difficulty with the M3s. Of interest, a US Army assessment at the time rated the Type 97 medium to be about equivalent to the American M3 light, and of course, ineffectiveness against Soviet BTs a few years earlier, which is why the Sunhoto Chihas with their 47mm were designed. In a scene which would make Himmelsdorf players proud, the tanks chased each other through the narrow streets and on occasion through the buildings. Supporting artillery could not partake for fear of hitting their own sides. Japanese infantry were present, but had only small arms. By about five hours later it was time to leave, and the tanks withdrew from Balawag, letting the TDs and artillery take over the task of giving the Japanese a hard time. By the time all was said and done, the Americans lost one M3 and the Japanese lost at least eight tanks, although some claims go as high as 30. Regardless, the Japanese received sufficient of a setback that the 51st Division were able to make their withdrawal. After the tanks and then the 51st rear guard passed over the bridge at 5 a.m. New Year's Day, the bridges were finally blown, leaving the Japanese quite a deep water obstacle to cross in order to continue their pursuit. The withdrawal to Bataan continued though, and the Japanese would not be held back behind the river too long. The next major engagement was the afternoon of the 5th, where two tanks of C-194, four TDs, and elements of the 31st Infantry ambushed the reinforced infantry battalion at Lubao. An estimated 50% casualties stopped that advance cold, keeping the next route to Bataan open. C of the 194th was the last unit to cross into Bataan at Lyak. After the loss of the tanks at Agno, the tankers had the final word on the destruction of the bridges. The commander of the 192nd, now Major Theodore Wickard, crossed over the bridge for a final check just before it was blown, only to find a platoon of his by the side of the road with the exhausted crews asleep inside. A quick wake up and a move later, they were over and the bridge was then blown, sealing off Bataan. This led to a good period for the tankers and a bad one. The good news was that they actually were given a break after the month of continuous action. The tanks were long overdue, their 400 hour services, the track pads were down to bare metal, and the tankers were down 36 tanks of the original number. What were 17 tank companies were reorganized to 10 tanks each, with platoons of three with spare parts either coming from cannibalized tanks or a storage facility found on Bataan which had supplies which had not been released when the tanks were first dispatched to fight. The tank groups attached 17th Ordnance Company Armoured carried out some pretty sterling work. This included home building some HE and canister rounds out of the AP cartridges. There were very few Japanese tanks encountered in the Bataan battles. The bad news was that, well, they were trapped on Bataan with little sign of relief, a lot of rather unfriendly Japanese were trying to kill them, and they were placed on half rations. The rest period lasted about three days. By the 10th, the tanks were back in action again, both used as mobile pillboxes to bolster defensive lines and also as a counterattacking force, such as when they had to restore the line penetrated by the Japanese 3rd Battalion 20th Infantry, just south of Mount Selangan. The headquarters troops were not excused from the fighting. For example, on the 26th of January, with their pistols and Thompson machine guns, they repelled close attack by Japanese infantry attempting to engage a TD platoon, 
butcher shelling and rather making a mess of the enemy's troops. By this point, the Japanese had, for pretty much the first time since their engagements with the Soviets a few years earlier, been fought to a standstill. The American Filipina holding action was holding. The Japanese had one significant advantage, however. The Americans had what troops were present. The idea of reinforcing the likely lost Philippines meant that units dispatched to the islands were instead detoured to Hawaii. The Japanese did lose their 48th Division, but in exchange received 4th Division, 21st Regiment of the 21st Division, and several thousand casualty replacements for the 16th Division and 65th Brigade. Oh, and more aircraft and naval infantry. In the meantime, the tankers were given a new role. For fear of an amphibious end run, the tankers were found on beach defense duty, with secondary taskings to react to situations on the front line. It wasn't the relaxing posting one might have expected, there were a lot of secondary taskings. None of which were pleasant, and unfortunately few were in company strength. The tanks were still a fairly novel item to most of the US and Filipino commanders, and so they were misused and often used without concentration. 2nd Lieutenant John Hay of C of the 192nd developed a rather novel form of combined arms technique. Assigned to support a group of Army Air Corps personnel pressed into rifleman service, he put six men on the back of each tank. Each man was given a bunch of grenades. He then drove his tanks forward. The Japanese would withdraw into their foxholes or bunkers to let the tanks pass. The airmen on the back just dropped the hand grenades. Lieutenant Hay ended the battle with two silver stars. Uh, but he did not survive the Japanese prison camps. Morale for the Americans was high at the time, but tempered by the dengue, malaria, and dysentery which started going around. By mid-March, they were down to quarter rations, and almost a quarter of the forces were out of action due to illness. Still, they held the line. At least until the 3rd of April, when, suitably reinforced, the Japanese launched their final assault. Over the next few days, the tankers fought a series of fire brigade type actions, with the single biggest movement being the hard tasked C of the 194th again, partaking in a counterattack supporting 45th Infantry Regiment. Five of the ten remaining 81mm mortar bombs caused sufficient mayhem that the 45th and the tankers were able to rout the Japanese forces facing them, yielding a bounty of artillery, mortars, mines, and small arms. The victory was short-lived though, as the Americans couldn't stay, the situation elsewhere on the line was getting desperate. Indeed, as they worked their way back south again, they discovered that the Japanese 65th Brigade had already gotten past. An ambush involving a 75mm Type 95 gun knocked out one tank. A second M3 discovered that the turret had enough armour to protect against a 75mm round, at least twice. That M3 survived. Three Type 89s encountered later did not. In what may have been a somewhat misguided thought, there actually was an attempt by the Japanese to make an amphibious landing, which they happened to do right in front of the 192nd, pretty much the entire battalion, in a bunch of canoes, fishing boats, and whatever else they could come up with. Their covering smoke fell short, and just made them better targets. Things did not go well for the Japanese there. However, moments of victory such as that were of limited effect in the larger scheme of things. With nearly 75% of the defenders out of the fight, it was time to throw in the towel. On the 9th of April, most of the tankers joined their colleagues in destroying their equipment and awaiting captivity. Not all mind. A few somehow managed to escape to Corregidor. Sergeant Bordowski, who got that first armoured force kill of the war, drove to the ferry with his tank, but was told there was no room. Doing a hasty sabotage, he boarded the ferry on foot and continued to hold out with the marines. His tank did eventually make it to Corregidor, but with a Japanese crew. Bardowski himself was bayoneted, but survived not only the experience, but the war in general. Such would not be said for many of the captured personnel, however. What followed has become known as the Bataan Death March. The emaciated and ill captured personnel were marched the 65 to 69 or so miles to Camp O'Donnell, just outside Manila with no food and no water. Those who fell out were shot, or after day one bayoneted. Word got around that those wearing armoured force insignia were being singled out. It was estimated that some 600 Americans and anywhere from 5,000 to 10,000 Filipinos did not make the distance. 
The survivors then had to make it through three years of Japanese military hospitality, and many did not. The town of Salinas, California, home of Sea of the 194th, as memory serves, suffered the highest casualties per capita in the US of any town, with somewhere under half of the servicemen killed. The 192nd Tank Battalion had 325 killed out of the total of 593 who sailed from San Francisco. Today there are annual Bataan Memorial Marches. Usually they are of marathon length, but occasionally some are the full 69 miles. They are done for charity today, occasionally in full kit of boots and backpack, etc. There is actually for me something of a personal connection. Sea of the 194th, memorialized in the painting and the monument of the crushing of the Japanese gun, eventually became Charlie of the 1st of the 149th Armor in Santa Cruz, California, which was actually my first unit in joining the US military. Their distinctive unit insignia now has the Philippine Carabao front and center of the symbol. That's the basically water buffalo, it's the national animal of the Philippines now. And though the unit motto is Men and Steel, the response is Remember the Road to Bataan. The unit received both US and Philippine presidential unit citations. The 194th Armor remains as part of the Minnesota Army National Guard. So there you go, an oft forgotten but terrible campaign and the start of the US Army's tank forces history in World War II. As ever, I'll see you next time. Take care.